Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Board Chasers. I'm Jason and this is my daughter Maddie. And we're here to bring you another forecast of a board game that we believe is a good game to play uh, uh, with your family. Um, and the game that we decided to choose today is Gizmos. Gizmos, which is um, a game that was produced uh, by uh, Simon. Uh, Phil Walker Harding is the designer. It's an engine building game uh, for two to four players. Uh, it says ages 14 and up, but as you can see, my nine-year-old daughter here is, is uh, an expert at the game, and I've been able to teach it to uh, many individuals that are, are kind of in the 11 to 12, 13-year-old range uh, without any uh, problem. It takes about 40 to 50 minutes to play. Uh, it's uh, If you've ever played any games like Splendor, or uh, like a Century Spice Road type of game. Um, it's in the same type of realm of uh, an engine builder type of game where you and uh, uh, your fellow scientists are trying to use different uh, types of energy in the form of these marbles uh, to spend that energy to purchase different gizmos uh, to try to, uh, to, to make your factory kind of run a little bit better. And so, um, we're going to uh, take a few moments to go over how the game plays for you, and then Maddie and I will come back and we'll give you our forecast for the game. All right, well, welcome to the uh, two-player setup for Gizmos here. I'm going to walk you through the setup as well as how a turn can be played, and then show you some of the different iconography that you'll find in the game, because I think that's probably the biggest challenge for people that are uh, that are learning this game for the first time is just being able to understand what the different icons mean. Generally, once you get past, once you get over that hump, it's a very quick game to learn. It plays very fast. And generally, the people that I've taught to play this game end up absolutely loving it because at first they feel like it might be a little bit challenging as far as understanding how to play it, but it actually comes to them very quickly. And so there are four of these strips, and this is your laboratory in front of you. Each one's going to get one. You'll see um, that this one's brown right here. All of the others are gray, like this one. The brown one signifies the first player. Um, the nice thing about this is it also kind of walks you through the different actions you can take on your turn, which are these four things right here. As far as setup goes, each one would get one of those. Everybody gets one of these uh, zero-point workbenches. Everybody also gets an energy ring. This is your storage ring to keep your energy. There are level one gizmos that are worth one victory point each. Shuffle those up, deal out four. Level two gizmos that are worth two to three victory points each. Shuffle them up, deal out three. And level three gizmos that are worth four to seven victory points each. It does state in the rules to uh, shuffle these up, randomly take out 20 because there should only be 16 in play at any given time. You also have victory point markers in the denominations of one and five. You have your energy uh, dispenser here, which is pretty cool. Once you get it set up, it goes right back into the box. The only thing that comes apart is this top part. Uh, you put all the marbles in there. Um, you have marbles that are black, red, yellow, and blue. And now we're ready to, to to, to play the game. Now, when you play the game, nobody starts with any energy uh, in their energy ring. Uh, the first player, obviously, like I said, is, is the brown. On your turn, you got uh, four different things you could do. Very simple. You could file, pick, build, or research. That is it. Uh, I'll go ahead and explain each one for you right now. Now, the file action is a way for you to reserve cards so that way other players can't get to them or you may even have cards that are kind of like the workbench that if it's got this symbol right here, every time you file something, you're going to trigger uh, whatever it says right there. And in this case, if we file one, you're going to get to pick a random marble. That's what that symbol means. And so in order to file one, you can take any one of these gizmos. So let's say I look at this gizmo here and I'm like, wow, it's going to cost me four blue. And so every card has a ring on the bottom here or a border on the bottom with the color as well as an icon for anybody that has any sort of issues seeing different colors. It's going to cost you four blue. It also tells you how many victory points in the upper right hand corner. So this card's with four victory points. It's nice because it tells you exactly where it should go on the workbench by the icon in the upper left hand corner. You just match it 
with that one. So when I do purchase this one, or if I do have the, enough Marvel's energy um, to, to put it uh, in my in my workshop, it would go directly over the top of this. Uh, the other ones would show the pick icon, or the build icon, or the research icon, the converter icon, or the upgrade icon. And I'll explain those in a little bit here. Uh, but if I was going to file this, I would just take it and put it off to the side in my archive. Now, because I did that, though, it triggered uh, this effect on this card, and so I get to pick a random marble on the top. That's the file action. The other action would be the pick action. And let's say I'm looking at uh, one of these other cards here, and I see that it's going to take one yellow to, uh, to get that card. If I didn't have room to archive, which I'll explain that in a few moments, I could just simply pick one, and that's my turn. If I uh, have energy uh, and I wanted to build something, I would just simply use the build turn, take that energy out of my energy ring, pop it back on the top, and then build whatever is there, and then just flip over a new card. The last turn, uh, the last action you could take is a research action. The research action, basically, if you don't like any of the cards that are out here, or if you want to try to uh, take cards that the others can't see, you can actually... Go to any one of these piles here, and if you look at your, um, your 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 upgrade area here, it tells you exactly kind of what you could do or how many of the marbles you can have. This basically says you can get five marbles in your energy ring. You can have more, no more than five. You can only archive one gizmo uh, when you do the file action at a time until you build that one. You could do another one. And then you could research three cards. This is telling you how many that you can research. And so you can actually go ahead and uh, for any one of these piles you could do for the research action. I could go to the level three if I wanted. And I could take three cards off the top. No one else gets to see them. And you could take a look at those cards and you could do one of two things with them. You could file one of them if you have room to file for later. Or if you did have the energy in your energy ring to pay six or five, you could actually pay that and build that. And the nice thing about it is no one else gets to see these. And so if you can actually uh, purchase one of them because you don't have enough energy, or let's say you already had something over in your archive so you couldn't file anymore, then you would just simply put them to the bottom of the pile. You will know that they'll end up coming back up later on but nobody else will. And so that's a little bit of a bonus for that one. Now, one of the trickiest parts about this game is just kind of learning the iconography on the cards. Um, I did kind of go over what, it, you know, what the card looks like you have, how much it costs, how many victory points it's worth, and where it's going to go in your, uh, in your, on your workbench. Um, each card has a, has a different kind of ability to it. These cards basically do the same thing. It's just different colors. Uh, it's basically a wild card. Any blue, any one blue that you have in your ring, not any, not any blue, but any one blue you have in your ring when you want to purchase something, if you've had this built and you have it under the converters, is basically any color that you want. And so that's what these kind of do right here. This card is basically just giving you more space in your energy ring, as well as it allows you to research more. Cards that look like this allow you to take one of one color and make it into two. And there's various other uh, types of cards in here. This card basically says if you pick uh, a yellow or a red from the, the the marbles you can see, not from the random marbles, you get to pick a random marble. If you build a yellow or a blue gizmo, you get to pick any marble that you can see. Yeah, that one's kind of similar. So is this one. And you can kind of see it's going to give you the same icons. This means pick. This means if you build, you get to pick. Uh, one yellow equals two yellows. This one right here is basically telling you that if you build a red or a blue, you get a, uh, one of these victory point tokens. And so you could actually, um, let me give you an example of, of one of the things you could potentially do in this. Is let's say kind of my laboratory looked a little bit like this. I have a couple of extra gizmos out here. So 
some converters. I've increased my stock a little bit. All right, so basically, the fun part about this game is the engine building. So if I have something like this set up right here, and it's my turn, and let's say I'd, I'd file this one right here. Well, because I filed both of these activate, I get to pull four random marbles. All right, so everybody takes their turn, comes back around to me, and now I've got this one right here. I've got a yellow marble. I'm gonna build this. And so I build this yellow one. So now I need to take a look at this. All right, so I built a yellow, so I get to pull a marble, all right? And so I'm gonna pull this yellow marble, but if you see, I also have a card that says, if I pull a yellow, I get to pull a random. So now I get to pull a random. I still gotta activate this card because I also, it's building yellow. Well, I'm gonna pull another yellow. Well, because I pulled another yellow, I get another random. Because I built from my archive, I get two victory points. And because I built a yellow, I get another victory point. So that turn right there just got me a bunch of marbles, some victory points. And so based on what you have out here, you could start to kind of strategize. What cards do I want to get? Well, I got a few cards here that are going to give me a bunch of victory points. So I'm going to want to probably, on my turn, file yellow, whatever it is, and then build that yellow because I'm going to get a bunch of marbles. And then I'm also going to get some victory points. And so that, to me, is the absolute shining part of this game is that every single time you play it, you can actually build a totally different engine. And it's an absolute blast triggering all these different things at the same time and seeing kind of what, what types of things you can come up with. The game ends, or the end of the game is triggered once somebody's built their 16th gizmo, or once somebody's built four of these level three gizmos. Then everybody gets a turn until um, that person to the right of the first player takes their, their final turn. At that point, you would take all of your gizmos, total up the number of victory points in the upper right hand corner, add any of these extra bonus victory points on there. There are also some cards um, in the level three, I believe. I don't believe there are any of the other ones that might give you some other victory point conditions as well. Like these two right here. This one basically says, for every marble you have left in your ring at the end of the game, you're gonna get a victory point. This one basically says, for every victory point token you have, you're gonna get another victory point. Um, so it's almost like doubling those. Uh, and then whoever has the most points wins at the end of the game. And that's Gizmos. All right, uh, and that's Gizmos. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the, the walkthrough on that. Um, very, uh, like much like we did the, mm -hmm. the playthrough for Welcome To in, in our videos, um, because of our, our love of, of board games and the weather, we're gonna look at this from, uh, we're gonna give you our forecast for this game. And, and, uh, and, and part of that forecast is, is gonna break down different aspects of the game. And one of the things, again, because th these videos are geared to try to find games that uh, families can play together, is um, one of the things I wanna ask Maddie about, and these are all gonna be questions for her because I want her take on this, is um, uh, is this game accessible uh, to the age range that they say 14 and plus, or like I said, uh, with Mandy being nine years old, is this a game that um, people are going to be able to get into fairly easily? Yes, the only kids I don't think that can do it are like little, little, little ones, like four and under. Okay, and so you do believe that this is a game that, that people could uh, learn fairly quickly? Okay, all right. Um, now, the, the other aspect of it is just the fun factor. Is this a game that once kids know how to play, is this a game that if their parents say, hey, you know, you want to play some gizmos, is this a game that they're going, going to want to play, or is this a game that they're going to feel like that they're, they're, they're only playing it because their parents are asking them to play it? They're going to want to play it. And why is that? Why would you say that? Because it's really fun to play. Okay. And what do you find most fun about the game? The things that I find most fun is like drawing the cards and drawing the marbles. Okay. All right. So you like being able to actually pull the marbles yeah, out of you. The something. marbles make a clicky noise. Okay. Like All right. Um, now, as far as the attention uh, span of, of people, obviously the attention span of, of people at different age ranges is going to be a little bit different. As we get into the younger, you know, the 
10, 11, even younger than that. Um, it, the length of gameplay, 40 to 50 minutes, I, I think that this actually could play in a, in a quicker range than that if you're, if, you're, if you're playing quick enough. Do you think that this is a game that kids are going to w want to finish what they start? Okay, and why would you say that? Because it's very like addictive, the game. You want to play it over and over again. Okay, all right. And the other aspect of it is, is this a game that, that you feel like that they're going to, to get a different experience out of each time? Or do you, do you find that this, the, the, and I'm getting really to the replayability of this game. Is this a game that as you pick it up, each time you play it, it's going to be different? Or do you sense that over time, this is going to get, it, it's going to kind of have a repetitive aspect to it? It can be different. It just depends on how many times you've played it and the cards that pop up. Yeah, I think I think that's a, that's the big key. And I, I've played this enough. I've played this probably about ten times, and I don't feel like any one of those plays has been the same. I mean, obviously you see a lot of the repeat cards, but I, I the way I look at it though is that you're the engine that you build. You could have an engine that's you're filing cards all the time, or you can have an engine that you're researching all the time. Um, you can have an engine where you're picking marbles, and because you built a lot of um, wilds into your uh, your uh, your workbench, that you're uh, uh, allowing yourself to spend those on different colors and stuff like that. So I think that the, the, there is replayability there. I do believe, though, that there are other games that, uh, like with with Welcome to, I think the replayability might be a little bit more there with that game, just because of the fact that the cards are so random. Um, now, how about the complexity, though? Is this a game that you think uh, uh, that that people, when they sit down to play it, are going to be uh, able to pick up quickly? Or is this a game that you think is might be too complex for the younger ages? This game isn't, like, too complex, but you will have to, like, think. Yeah, and I, I think that, um, again, it's really the icons. Like, think ahead. Okay, so you're, you're saying that there's some planning ahead that might be involved yeah. in this game. Okay. Um, I don't think that there's so much, though, that it's going to turn someone off that yeah. that hasn't played these type of games before. Yeah, um, it's not that complex. Uh, and I get that when I uh, played this game with some of the members of my board game club, the Cardboard Coliseum at my school. Um, I think that at first they, they were skeptical as to whether or not they're going to be able to do it but once they understood the icons I, I honestly I think once you get to the icons and you understand those then that complexity level goes way down um the component quality is excellent um this this little dispenser is absolutely it's amazing it's like so cool it is pretty cool um and it's nice because um once you get it put together the first time it there's actually a the insert in the box it uh holds it all together for you the only piece you have to take off is this part. Mm -hmm. uh, the plastic marbles are nice. I might have liked them as, as glass. Um, the little, the little uh, energy rings were kind of nice. The one issue that I have maybe is with the perforations on um, the workbenches for the uh, for the players. I could see this over time kind of falling apart. But to be honest with you, I think everything else is, is put the together pretty well. What I don't well. like about the workbenches is when you like put them down like this, mm -hmm. they bend right there. Yeah, and again, that's just, you know, that's a minor thing. But but I, I do agree that, that it's kind of being finicky a little bit. Um, and so, just like with all of, uh, of the the, the um, reviews that we do, we're going to give you a little bit of a forecast. And our forecast for this is going to be it's a forecast of mostly, mostly sunny. sunny. With a chance of fantastical engine building. Uh, we do believe that this game uh, is great two to four players. Um, I would take the age range from you know maybe eight or nine and up, depending on on the on the individuals that you're playing with. Um, but I really do believe that uh, Simon and Phil Walker Harding did a spectacular job with this game. Kudos to them. It's an absolutely amazing game. We highly recommend it, and we do think you should check it out. So once again, uh, hit that uh, subscribe button and hit that bell. Uh, we do apologize for not. Uh, uh, sticking to our one week uh, a review that we have promised you with the last video, but things got kind of busy. Yeah. Um, and we're, we're going to try to to pick up the pace a little bit because yeah. um, <clears throat> in this golden era of board games, it's this is such a great way to to bring families together and have some uh, uh, good times, um, but also um, to hone and sharpen the the critical thinking and communication skills. 
Um, I really think that this has helped Maddie and, and my son Lachlan out as well when I'm playing games with him, uh, be able to, to learn how to communicate with each other. And in this day and age, we don't see that as much. And so uh, um, this is Jason. Maddie. Uh, for Board Chasers, um, we'll see you on the flip side.